In this screencast, we're going to talk about some non-Mendelian types of inheritance. So we talked about Mendel and his rules. He said that traits are dominant or not dominant, that they segregate and recombine independently, uh, and that different they segregate and that there's segregation and independent assortment of different traits together. Uh, but when we look at a lot of animals and plants, we don't see that. So for example, if we look at carnations, we've got a red carnation and a white carnation. And if we say, okay, the genotypes are RR and RW, what happens if I cross them and get an RW? Well, I get a pink carnation. Okay, so Mendel didn't, he wouldn't have expected this. He would have said either red's dominant or white's dominant. This was kind of the, the hypothesis before Mendel, this idea of blending, kind of like paint. If I take a little bit of white and a little bit of red and blend it, I'll get a mixture. I'll get something in between. And we see this with a lot of things, right? If you have a tall person and a short person and they have kids, their kids will probably be somewhere in the middle, right? If you have someone with very dark pigmentation and light pigmentation, the kids will probably be in the middle. They'll have some kind of middle blended form. So we do occasionally see this, but we say that Dominance is definitely the rule. It's what we see most of the times, but there are some exceptions, and we call this exceptions, this blending uh, intermediate inheritance. So let's look at that in Snapdragon. So here we have a red Snapdragon and a white Snapdragon, and the genotypes, we're using superscripts here uh, because they're equally dominant, they're co-dominant, they're, 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 they form an intermediate. So if we cross the red and the white, we get a pink. Okay. Well, what happens if we cross two of these? You can see it's got the red allele and the white allele. So obviously Mendel's rule of dominance doesn't apply here, but how about his rule of segregation? So when we cross the F1 generation, the first generation of offspring, we still get the predicted ratio that Mendel would have expected. It's just that the heterozygotes here are pink. So we get two pink, we get one white, and one red. So we get this one to two to one ratio in the F2 generation when we cross the heterozygote. So we see that Mendel's rule of segregation is still applying. These alleles are still segregating and recombining. They're not just blending to form all pink offspring. But we see that the, in this case, the rule of dominance doesn't apply. So we call this again intermediate inheritance, when two traits blend together in the heterozygote. Okay, well, let's look at another one. This one's similar, but a little bit different, okay? So let's look at cows. This is called a roan cattle, and a roan is a cross between a brown and a white. Now, this looks a little bit like that last one, intermediate inheritance, but in this case, if we looked at the hairs, we see half of them are white, half of them are brown. There's a 50-50, so in this case, there's no clear dominance between brown and white and we get this roan offspring that half are white, half are brown. This we call codominance. So in other words, in this case, either one will be expressed, one or the other, um, but it won't be blended. Uh, another example of this is if you cross a black chicken and a white chicken, you get a checkered chicken. You get a check chicken that has half black and half white feathers. A little bit different than a gray chicken. That would be sort of an intermediate inheritance. Um, so. Another type of non-Mendelian inheritance that we see in humans is blood type. So I have type A blood. Um, that is my phenotype. My genotype, I, if I'm homozygous, I could be that, or I could be that. Notice if I have a little i, that's actually the allele that's going to code for type O blood. So notice the genotype for a person with type O blood, which is 40% of the population, a lot of people are type O, is little i, okay? Um, if I have type B, or if someone has type B, they could be homozygous for it or heterozygous for it. So when we see a person or two people type A blood and they have a child with type O blood, we know that they must be heterozygous, okay? Or if we have a person that is type AB blood, we know that one parent must carry the A allele and one parent must carry the B allele to produce and A, B in their offspring, okay? And why is this important? Well, this is important because if I have type A blood, my blood is gonna produce antibodies, that's what this anti stands for, that attack anything with the B protein. So if I take a transfusion from someone with type B, my body attacks those blood cells. These are coagulating, they're getting destroyed. Or if I take type A, B blood, because that also has the B in it, my body's gonna reject that. It's gonna attack those blood cells. It's not gonna like them. I can take A, 
or O, because someone with type O doesn't have any of the A or B proteins on their blood. So they're what we call a universal donor. They can give to anyone. Okay. Conversely, if I, someone has type B blood and I give them type A, they produce antibodies to attack A, and they're going to attack and destroy that. And type AB blood, since that has the A protein as well, that's no good. They can only accept from type B or type O persons. Notice type O can give to anyone. That's, again, why we call them the universal donor. Okay. The universal recipient is persons with type AB. Notice any type of blood that they get is good because they have both the A and B proteins in their blood. So any blood that comes given to them is going to have either the AB or neither the A or B. So they're what we call the universal recipient. They can take anyone's blood. So let's look at a couple examples of blood typing. So I've got four people here, okay? And the way we do blood typing is we mix some antibodies that are going to either attack A or B and C. And if they attack them, you can see Jack here has got antibody A attacking his blood. It's all coagulated. And antibody that attacks the B protein attacking his blood. So what kind of blood do you think Jack has? Okay, well, if it's attacking A, he's got A. And if it's attacking B, he's got B. So he's type AB. Okay. Jill, it's attacking antibody A is attacking her blood, but antibody B is not attacking. So obviously she's got the A protein, right? But not the B protein. So she's type A blood. Okay. Adam over here, he's got the antibody B attacking his B proteins, but not antibody A. So Adam must be type B blood. And then if we look at Eve, neither of the antibodies are attacking her blood. So she has no proteins on her blood that are causing this, this problem with these antibodies. So she must be type O. Again, that's why we say O is a universal uh, donor. They can give to anyone. Um, they don't have any antibodies. Okay. Some other things we tend to see are, for example, when I was little, uh, I had red hair, freckles, and blue eyes. I had two brothers. They had brown hair, brown or hazel eyes, and no freckles. Um, and I thought it was always weird. Why did I get all three of these traits? And they didn't get any of them, right? Well, one thing that that could have been, and I don't know this for a fact, but it's my hypothesis, is that maybe those are what we call linked traits. They're on the same chromosome, right? So the blue eyes, the red hair, and the freckles, you either got them or you didn't get them, okay? Whereas the brown hair, brown eyes, and no freckles, was passed on. So again, during meiosis, forming sex cells, either you got all of them on the chromosome or you got none of them on the chromosome, right? So that's when we say some traits are linked. It means you get them together because they're on the same chromosome, okay? Now, uh, for example here, the segregation, you'd get uh, big A, big B. You, you wouldn't get all the combinations during, due to independent assortment. You would just get either big A, B, or little a, little b, right there. The only two possible combinations. We talked about how crossing over occurs during meiosis, and that's when we can actually mix these up. And then we can start to see that we do get sort of switching of these. So now you've got the blue eyes with the non-freckles, or the red hair with the non-freckles, and you create some of that genetic variation. And this is important because we've actually used this recombination of linked genes to do what's called genetic mapping, to figure out where genes are located in proximity to each other on a chromosome. So we've learned a lot about actually where genes are by looking at how they cross over, how frequently they cross over. Um, so sex linkage, remember linkage, we said they're all found on the same chromosome. If it's sex linked, it's on the X chromosome. The X chromosome is a really big chromosome. It's got several hundred genes on it. The Y chromosome is tiny. It's only got about 30 genes on it. So we see a lot of genes on the X. And why is that important? Well, that's important because certain diseases like hemophilia and red-green colorblindness are due to genes on the X chromosome. What we tend to see here is we tend to see things like uh, the gene for hemophilia is recessive and it's on the X. And if a woman carries that, she's normal, but she has a 50-50 passing it on to her son. One son could get that X, the other son got the normal X. So we tend to see sex link traits appear in males. Now because it's recessive, he only has one X, he's going to have that disease. The daughter will carry that X, but she's not affected. She's what we call a carrier. So we tend to see 
These sexing traits get passed from mother to son because a son can't carry a recessive trait and not express it. He will have that disease if he has it. Okay. What about if the father has it? Well, the father only passes his X on to his daughters. So he can pass it on to her or her, but because mom is normal, they're going to get a normal X from their mother and they're not going to be impacted. Right? So um, we tend to see, again, sexing traits cannot be passed from father to son because the son will always get the Y from the father, never the X. Right? And otherwise, he'd be a daughter. Okay, uh, so an example of that uh, we see is in tortoiseshell cats. So it turns out fur color, black and orange fur color specifically in cats, is carried on the X chromosome. So a female cat that has the B allele and an orange allele, they're co-dominant, uh, will look like this. That's the tortoiseshell. The eyes are a little weird because they reflect the light, but that's the color of the coat. Okay, Males can't have that color, right? So a male could have the B allele and then he'd be a black cat, or he could have the orange allele and be an orange cat. But you couldn't see a male cat with both those because male cats only have one X chromosome. Some other things that affect, affect um, inheritance or expression of genes are environmental factors. So hydrangeas, these grow a lot around New Orleans. You see them, they grow in shady areas. If you see blue flowers, it means that the soil is acidic. So the acid soil actually turns on different genes in the, in the, plant, in the flower. Uh, basic soils produce purple flowers. So that's an example of gene affecting a trait. We see that in humans because when humans are exposed to UV rays, it causes genes to produce a uh, something called um, melanin, which causes them to get darker. So getting tan is an environmental response to UV rays. So the more you're out in the sun, the darker your pigmentation will be, right? Unless you're like me and you just don't get tan. Um, but that's a, another example of the environment responding or genes responding to the environment and changing a phenotype, right? Not just something that you inherit. Um, and then the last thing, many human traits are actually polygenic, right? We know that we're not just tall or short like Mendel's pea plants were. We are many different degrees of there. Some people are really short, some are somewhat short, some are somewhat tall, some are, you know, average. Um, pigmentation is the same thing. We tend to see that you're not just black or white. Everyone is on a spectrum. Some people have a lot of pigment, some people have very little pigment, right? But to say that, you know, this guy's black and this guy's white, well, what is this guy, right? Or, or what is she? Well, we're all just a variation uh, on this spectrum because it's many genes that determine pigmentation. And that's what polygenic means. Again, poly means many, gene, gene means genes. Many genes govern this trait. So um, the fact that pigmentation, height, eye color, hair color, uh, hair texture, we're not just you know curly or straight, some are wavy, some are loose curls, some are tight curls. Many, many of the traits that affect humans are polygenic, so it's a little difficult to kind of isolate like Mendel did with his peas a lot of our traits, but we'll look at some that are due to one set of uh, alleles on a gene and we'll, we'll look at those. So uh, that's pretty much it. Here's a little comic strip about biologists and uh, their first dates doing pun and squares and uh, anyway a little nerdy biology humor for you. Okay.